pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The purpose of our meeting this evening is uh, the next capital project, and we will have a presentation from Mrs. Zimmerman and Mr. Schultz. Oh, thank you. Coming up, Mr. Schultz. Come right on over. Come on. <laughs> team presentation here. Oh, I thought you were a tag team. That's what it was. <laughs> so before I jump into this, I just want to reiterate a um, purpose tonight. This is the first of many, many planning meetings that we're going to have as we move forward in planning our next capital improvement project. Our goal here tonight is to share some background on how capital projects are planned, including financial implications of how they're planned and how that all plays a role into a lot of critical decision making. We're going to talk about timeline of capital projects and why it's important to stay within the boundaries of a specific timeline. And then finally, we're going to offer for you a preliminary scope that's been informed in a lot of different ways that we'll go through here tonight. Our goal is not to make any decisions tonight. It's not to narrow this. It's just to start a discussion. Our goal is not even necessarily to prioritize, but it, rather just to give you information to start a conversation. So following this presentation, we'll ask the board to do just that, to start a conversation. Uh, at that point, I will, will likely be charged with gathering additional information, um, which is fine. And as I said before, this is just one of many conversations. This will be followed by community surveys, public forums for our community to come and ask questions, provide input, give us feedback. All of that information will then be turned key back to the board for subsequent work sessions as we work to narrow the scope within a timeline that I'm going to present to you tonight. There will be time for questions and answers tonight. We've also invited our architects from Highland Associates and construction management firm from the Chase uh, for any questions that you may have, depending on the degree of specificity that Carrie and I might not be able to answer for. So with that, we'll jump right in. As you well know, I always start with grounding us in our vision and our mission for the district because everything we do is aligned to that uh, and to our district goals. Capital projects are no different. It's important to keep this in the back of your mind as you ask questions regarding what to include or perhaps what not to include. And this is all grounded on the assumption that we remain dedicated to educating the whole child. So projects and facilities improvements should touch on the academic well-being of students, social emotional well-being, physical well-being of all of our students pre-K through 12. So why do we do capital projects? Primarily to ensure that our students and staff and our community members enjoy high quality facilities that meet a variety of both learning needs and community use. Also always underscored by the importance of remaining fiscally responsible to achieve not just what makes sense today, but what makes sense for the long term stability of our district. Real high level, how are they planned and implemented? Right now, here we are, planning phase. We look at needs assessments. We consider different sources of information as we begin to have these conversations. We engage in board and community input, and as I mentioned before, additional surveys, other public hearings. Then we move to some initial design planning, work a little more intimately with our architects and construction managers. There's an application process that goes to state ed and a number of different approvals and a long timeline that's associated with that. And then we move into bidding and construction. Of course, within all of this is the important component of going to referendum for our community for voter approval and any project that we put forth. So what are those various sources that are used to inform what is prioritized within a project? We're looking at our building condition survey that's done approximately every five to seven years in school districts. That's over, uh, seen and submitted back to the New York State Education Department. 
We look at our annual visual inspections to identify those items that are approaching end of life and that need to be replaced. Some items might be at end of life that weren't necessarily included in any of these, so we take consideration of that. They might be items that were identified as priority two or three items in a previous project, but now, since that project's over, have raised to priority one. Information and feedback from stakeholders, questions, input that people may have, whether it is you know, at an open house night, being approached by parents or family members with questions about when are we going to do this thing. Overall, we want to ensure that our district is future ready. When we're planning a project, because of the timeline, you're always a few years away from seeing that to fruition. So in a sense, we kind of have to take that crystal ball and try to determine what are our future goals. That's where our vision comes into play. And what do we need to be thinking about now to inform that, to ensure that a facility can support where we believe that we are going uh, as we move forward to the future. And I already talked about that alignment piece. So what are things to do that would inform a responsible plan moving forward? We have to look at trends in enrollment. We look at data that can help inform that we can ground ourselves in. What has been our historical use of facilities? And again, what do we anticipate the future use of those to be? We engage in consultation to get feedback from the professionals on capital projects. We seek that community input. And again, I can't underscore how important that long-term fiscal planning is for the district. So well, that's just a little bit of background. I want to pause for a minute and look at some data. And I offer this because this helps to inform that future focus as we're moving forward. This first chart here looks at regional enrollment trends over the past five years. Keeping in mind that this data that's uploaded from Bed State each year is always a year behind in the state reporting. However, the patterns here are, are nonetheless significant. So I've tried to color code it here according to districts within our most immediate region. Not necessarily comparable size, but where do we live? What districts do we touch on? What is our great community that we potentially um, serve here? And here we're looking at trends. What I think is the most notable in all of this, the top three districts here with the greatest number of students, of course, are Walton, uh, Unitigo, and here we are in our Maroon, Delaware Academy. What's an interesting finding is that while you see downward trends in enrollment in almost every district, even when we get into our smaller districts here, we have one district that has remained, if you look at a regression line, pretty much stable with a little increase on the end, <clears throat> and that's Delaware Academy. So is that a trend that's reliable? Is that something that will continue? When we look at live birth rates in Delaware County, if I draw your attention to this line right here at the top, this line at the bottom is the year in which students were entering kindergarten. Here are birth years and the years that we're anticipating that they will be coming to join us. So what this suggests is that if all the students or children that were born in uh, the region of our school district didn't move, stayed with us, and we had no other kids moving in, and if it was a one for one, these lines would pretty much line up. But they don't because people move out, other families move in, and it you know, adds or decreases as we go. But if we were to project, if these kids didn't move out and we project based on live birth rate, we can anticipate an increase in some of our class sizes over the next few years. Just a little bit of background. <clears throat> so back to planning of projects then. What are the goals of the overall project that I would offer you? Historically, this district has, has been a great steward of any kind of capital improvement project planning with the ability to stay, to, to stay tax neutral. And by that, I mean that there are no additional taxes that are added to support projects. And, and that is something that I know we remain committed to as we are planning this project. And that's the first thing that starts to set some parameters on how big of a project we can look at. Uh, it doesn't suggest that you go to the max either. We'll present a few scenarios for your consideration. 
The goal of the project should be responsive to community input and feedback. So how do we do that? That's where our public forums come into play. That's where results of the survey come into play. That's where a lot of uh, PR surrounding all of that comes into play. That's where our students come into play, right? Because we want student, in, student input uh, to provide this too, so that we can really get an accurate pulse on what our community members are thinking. Here's that alignment piece again. When we think about those trends that we just saw on the past few slides, and I listen to what we're discussing in New York State, what some commission, our commissioner of education is starting to talk about this concept of regionalization of high schools. When we hear of some of our neighbors who are struggling to staff and are moving toward redirecting students, I can't help but start to think about, in fact, we would be remiss if we didn't try to position ourselves as a destination district moving forward for our community and our region. We want projects that prioritize our needs, our safety, security, facilities, maintenance, kind of goes without saying, and again, ensures long-term sustainability of both our programs throughout the district and our facilities. So again, just to illustrate the success that we have had as a district at not adding that additional burden to our taxpayers for projects, just a quick history of what we've been able to achieve thus far uh, at Delaware Academy. We're currently closing out the capital project that you've all been intimately familiar with. These are some of the highlights of the things that we achieved in there. These are just some updated pictures of how the improvements to these facilities in our elementary building primarily. Here you see the results of the CWC project that came through. And of course, as we were entering this current capital project, we determined, oh, we need to go for that quick asbestos um, abatement project, uh, which kind of went hand in hand. Most recently, uh, replaced our tennis courts, and I think I saw some students out there playing today. Um, and uh, those were a build, bid alternate in this project here and we were able to achieve that for our community. Uh, our elementary playground is just nearing completion right now. And prior to that, the last formal capital project was in 2013. So given history, a little bit there of capital projects, taking a look at our uh, enrollment and kind of what we need to be thinking about as we move to the future, I want to shift right now and talk about what kind of things do we think about and how do we set ourselves up for that goal of being sustainable into the future from purely a financial planning perspective? And so how do we do that? You've heard us talk over the past few years about establishing cycles of, project, of, of projects that maintain stability and predictability with consideration for long-term debt. And by that, I'm specifically referring to how we allocate our debt reserve and why it's so important to continue to replenish that. But at the same time, we need to think about, with that debt is falling off, the importance of bringing that back on through projects so that it becomes a cycle that is predictable, <coughs> stable, and has, gives us the ability to continue to engage in projects with that mutual impact. It's understanding how New York State building aid flows into that, where 73.3% 73 of building aid in New York State at Delaware Academy. When all that is done correctly, you can continue to support capital projects with zero to minimal impact on taxpayers, no additional tax burden. So I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Schultz to step up and give us a few examples of what exactly that looks like. An example of when that goes wrong, an example of when that's successful. I just want to go back real quick. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I will say that working here, very fortunate enough that this district has been very vigilant in creating a debt reserve. So when we talk about predict, you know, this maintains stability and predictability in long-term debt, I always say to people, think of a capital project like you would your own house. You're not just gonna tomorrow say, hey, let's put a new bathroom in or new countertops or a new kitchen, not unless you can afford it. Um, so I always kind of 
reduce it down. I also say in the same aspect, we can't just do that here because that's a $900,000 project for bathrooms. So we can't inject that budget to budget. So that's why sometimes when people say, well, why didn't you get that done in the budget? Because it's so large. Again, this is what capital projects are for. But we also get, as Kelly was saying, 73 cents on the dollar. So we try to take advantage of that as much as possible. But working here, coming in here almost eight years ago, there was a debt reserve that was established. And this board has continuously allocated funds, unexpended funds, each year to that debt reserve. Um, so that's when we talk about that, that's basically kind of a savings account for those kitchen projects or those bathroom projects that you would do in your own home. It's your own savings account. So I will say that I've been in other districts, they don't have this. So every time you go for a capital project, they're not only asking the board to decide on a project, but they're also asking the taxpayers to vote on a project that's gonna cost them more money without adding anything to program at some point. So we are very fortunate here that we do have that and we continue to fund it. Um, building aid, basically each district has some type of building aid. Uh, we, like Kelly was saying, 73%. That's about average. You see 70 to 80% for most districts. Uh, and again, we take advantage of that. I sometimes often tell people, if you're not gonna get it, somebody else down the road is gonna get it, all right? So taking advantage of that and keeping up the cycles is really important for the district. This is no district in particular, and I really made this very elementary, so I just want to talk about it real quick. <clears throat> this is a district, this is a bad district. This is a district that's not doing it correctly. And I'm not saying that everyone is perfect because timing is really important in these projects, and timing, I mean, things can really slow a project down pretty quickly, as the architects know and CM knows every day. Um, but you try to do your best when you're planning a project to do one of two things. First of all, try to get debt added as debt is falling off, just like you would. Again, going back to your own home or your own lifestyle, you're not going to go buy more things if you can't afford it at that time. You're going to try to make sure, well, car loan ends, I'm going to get another car. So same kind of thing. What happens with districts though, if they don't plan accordingly and they don't have good fiscal planning or they're Need your reactions on some kind of project sometimes, what happens is you end up with an increase from budget to budget. And so what happens is you have added debt coming on. The only way to get that is from tax revenue. You're not going to get it from the state that much because, to be honest, you're only going to get about maybe 2% each year for fund or for um, foundation aid. So what happens, you end up with a cyclic pattern in the budget. You know, 1.6 for us would be $160,000 a year. We would have to inject into the budget ask taxpayers to take that out of their own pocket before funding any new contractual increases or any new programs. So this district has no reserves. They've added debt when they shouldn't be adding debt and before it's falling off and actually increasing their budget for four years, 160,000 and then increasing it for three years at 320. So now they're really stacking their budget and asking for a lot from their taxpayers. I would say this, if you're going to go out for a 3.2% increase just on a building, just on building debt, you're probably not going to pass your budget. Obviously, we know that. District B, same kind of situation, but they have reserves. Or they're trying to, to make sure that they have debt falling off and debt adding at the same time. You don't see these big swings doubling in uh, dollar amounts or percentages as far as tax levy. Like I said, when we look at a project, we always say, okay, we're looking at an $8 million, $9 million project. The first thing I say to fiscal advisors is, how can we do this without any additional tax impact? And they will come back and say to me, you need to put up a million dollars to do it. Okay, great. That's our starting point. That's basically what we do. Anytime we call fiscal, we give them a number and no additional tax impact. <laughs> And so we fund this debt reserve on a yearly basis to make sure that we have money to take care of these projects in particular. Um, the other thing is making sure that you have debt falling off coming on at the same time. Like I said, it's not always perfect. Right now, the project that we're discussing, the timeline we'll discuss in a minute, there's about four years where there's added debt to the taxpayer, but actually not added. It's added to the budget to budget increase and that's where we would look back and say, okay, what do we need to take out of debt reserve? It's not a 10 year span, it's only a four year span. Like I said, it's not perfect, but we know we have debt falling off the next year, and we have, and that was planned perfectly because now we have new debt coming in from this project we just finalized. 
So there's no shift there. We just have a small shift within the four-year window. And we have debt reserve to take care of that. Talking about debt reserve, <clears throat> I went back all the way to 1819 just to give you an idea of what we have put in, what we've taken out. These are Delaware Academy numbers now. Yes, these this are real numbers. Us. These are our numbers. This is how we've done it. Um, each year you can see additions throughout the whole time. These last four years in 22, 23, and forward into 2026 are just basically assumptions. If you see, we put in quite a bit, at least half a million to a little over a million each year. This number right here shows a decrease of two and a quarter million, a little over two and a quarter. This is a combination of about 3.1 million that we're putting and backing off of the debt that we're gonna borrow at the end of June for this last project. And 900,000 being added. So we're adding again after this year. And then but basically we spend about 95, 96% of our budget each year. The rest of the reserves that we have are very healthy. So I don't see any big swings of them or us having to take money out of those or fund them any more than what they are now. So continuing this cycle is the best, probably the best route. That, therefore, you have you can have projects keep going each year and not have those big swings of 1.6, 3.2, things like that. Any questions about this? So financial planning, again, Phone call to fiscal advisors, Ben Meslone, I know him well, I've worked with him for 17 years, I think. <clears throat> we talked to Ben, we said, listen, what would a project size of 10 million be with no tax impact? Interesting enough, it's 840,000 of debt reserve that would be needed and we wouldn't see any swings in the year to year um, budget based upon, <coughs> you're asking, well, wow, that's, you put 2.9 million in the last project and you're only putting 840 into this one. It's because of the way the cycle is going to work, where we have debt falling off right before and after that four-year cycle. So we're really good window. We're not an eight or ten-year window. We're only four years. So we plan accordingly on that. <clears throat> Project size of twelve million would be about one point four million out of the debt reserve, and then two million for a fourteen million dollar project. So we have those numbers now. We know they're very conservative numbers. Um, we would look for a district vote around October, probably around the same time next year. Takes a little while, once we get district vote and approval, then architects go to work. They put the plans together, get it to SCD, SCD approval. David, where are they with SCD approval now? Eight to 10. Eight to 10 weeks? It's yeah. pretty impressive. Um, it's improved. <clears throat> yeah, I've been with, it's eight to 10 months usually, <laughs> try to ask. Uh, construction start date would be around 24, 25, probably in the summer of 25. Am I correct? Summer of 2024. You got a bid cycle probably in that winter and then start date, yeah. Probably maybe even start in the winter of 25 uh, or um, 24. 24, and maybe even after the first year, depending on what the project entails. First year of eight. Your first year of construction, you're not taking a bond out. You're not taking any long-term debt out right away. You're only taking short-term debt because you're not spending all the money up front. So there's no reason to take $10 million up as a loan if you're not going to spend it all, you know, all, all of a sudden. So you take a little bit. In this last project, the first year of construction, you took a $300,000 short-term one-year no. We pay interest on that, but that's figured into the calculations for long-term debt. <clears throat> We so, then took another, I'm sorry, go ahead. I say when you hear people talk about bond anticipation notes or bans, that's what you're referring yeah. to. And then again, we renewed it this year for the full amount because we needed the extra money. We had to renew it for the three million and replenish that, and then you replenish for the, the other six million just to make up for all the rest of the construction costs. Mm -hmm. First year of A, once you start about 25, 26, you're gonna get a little bit of A, and then like I said, the A, the, uh, a ratio here is a little over 73%. In a nutshell, that's kind of how it works. Um, I know it's a lot at once, but it's really kind of these stages and, and steps that we have to take. Uh, again, you're not taking all the debt out automatically. You're waiting. Like I said, we're not taking any long-term debt for this last project until the end of June. Right. That'll be the first time. So, so we talk, we're going to talk a little bit about the breakdown of kind of the items that we have in this project currently that we're kind of putting in there just to see the, to start the discussion. We have what we call construction costs. I call them hard construction costs. That's 
that's materials, that's steel, that's sheetrock, that's everything else. Um, and then to be eligible for aid, anytime you say state aid, you have to just do ten thousand dollars worth of work inside the building. Um, contingency funding or contingency costs are basically, and I'm gonna, you have to chime in on how that's fine. Basically, you're kind of you're kind of setting yourself and hedging your bets to make sure that their dollars now are taken care of for later. So I may say, okay, well, something costs ten dollars now, but maybe fifteen dollars in two years by the time we break ground. Um, we saw that with paving is huge. Uh, so when they build a project, we build in contingencies, we build in safety nets to make sure that when we get to that final step, we go, oh, we don't have enough money for this now. So we're, we're, they speculate and they look at that and calculate out forward and they look at current trends and and I know that we were at one number, now we're at seven and a half, I mean not one number, but you were, contingency costs have gone up quite a bit. For so part of the COVID, the estimation of fact you would normally put in would be one and a half, now we're factoring in seven and a half is what we've seen across the board. For an estimation factor, just for one contingency that we put in. So again, just go back to what I will do later when I get out of here, go to the grocery store and spend $25 more than I would probably two years ago on products that were the same. So um, incidental cost, basically anything that's outside work, um, anything regarding like uh, paving or sidewalks or uh, anything like that is basically called an incidental cost. We call incidental costs soft costs or in, in, in incidental costs soft costs are also they're related to construction management fees, architect fees, legal fees, printing costs, bond costs, which you know you have to pay someone to put the bond up for it to be bid on. Um, so that's what incidental costs are. So you have not only do you have hard construction costs, but you've got these two things that are factored in when we look at any kind of any kind of work being done in the district. So we're going to move into, we're taking a, a little less conventional approach here. Typically at these very early planning phases, we don't assign dollar figures. However, as you'll see later, when we talk about the timeline and the importance, again, to stay in that cycle that Mr. Schultz was just talking about, we wanted to throw out some preliminary numbers to you um, for two reasons. We want to maintain a sense of transparency um, with both our board and with our community because we're talking about real numbers here. But as you look at these, please keep in mind that these are really rough estimates based on today's kind of pricing. The reason that we spent a minute to kind of share some of these definitions is because you'll see in here what a total construction estimated preliminary construction cost would be and then what the associated contingencies would be on top of that. That includes trying to anticipate for those escalators when it comes time to actually do the project. And another reason why it's important to consider those is because when you go to the voters for a vote, the referendum reads an overall amount that you cannot exceed without subsequent voter approval. And so that has to represent and, and take into consideration all of these contingency costs. It all has to be folded in there, which is why we're offering those to you just for consideration tonight. So again, wherever you see reminder on the next few slides, those are the reminders that as we started just putting together our starting point for you, this is kind of where it has come from. This is not a final scope. In fact, it's, it's likely to be far from it. But again, it's a starting point for your consideration. Stuff might come into this that's not even on there. Stuff may fall out of it. And that's okay, and we don't have to make any of those decisions tonight. Again, starting point. So in the current project that's being closed out right now, we did a lot of work in the elementary building. So we updated the cafeteria, we updated the library media center, we did a lot of HVAC stuff in that building. So the scope of the next project related to the elementary school is going to be significantly less for that reason. And you'll see the focus really shift more back to this building. Um, the items that you see here are black. These are really what we feel come out of the gate are your priority one items. Items in the blue are somewhat secondary to that, still somewhat urgent, 
but a little more flexibility within that. And that kind of pattern will follow all the next slides. Pretty standard in the elementary. The biggest piece being in the elementary school is continuing the paving of that upper lot of the elementary. The next few slides also um, are what you have before you for reference later on uh, as we move into the work session. So we won't need to keep flipping back and forth. Then we move to the middle and high school. Again, our reminders, and you're gonna see a lot more in here at a significantly greater cost. The biggest piece within here is a renovation of our technology and agriculture innovation space um, and greenhouse area. So I'm gonna pause and take a little more time to explain that a little more, because that's a huge instructional component that, in my opinion, Delmar Academy is behind on when we look at our neighbors. And it's a, a big gap in our uh, curriculum that we offer our students. Currently, we don't have the ability to offer pre-engineering, pre-architecture uh, coursework, or places, destination spaces, where teachers can bring classes to engage in project-based learning um, and, and fabrication and design kind of stuff. So I am gonna take a minute and explain that in a little more detail. But overall, just some other pieces, more paving. We've got a, a lot of outdoor kind of stuff that is beyond disintegrating. This is the back alcove entrance here. Um, with further disintegration, clearly becomes a safety issue. We've got a side, significant cracks in a lot of our sidewalks that we continue to patch that I occasionally get my heels stuck in. Um, but you can see that a lot of this is, is you know, not that beautiful, flashy kind of stuff. As we move into those blue areas, um, the tower at the top of our school, the beautiful gold tower, not only is all that paint chipping off again, but it's, it's leaking inside as well. So we need to be starting to think about where that sits in a future project. Um, auditorium lighting and sound, um, safety, security, all those kind of things are also put in here for your consideration. But I want to stop for a minute here and just dig a little bit deeper into that instructional space. These are some kind of our current pictures that you see right now when you go down to our technology wing. Uh, we are accredited for career and technical education and agriculture through New York State. That's something that we take a lot of pride in. It's something that we do well. It's something that we want to keep and continue to move forward. We teach traditional wood shop. Uh, we dabble in small animal science and we have welding booths currently for welding one and two coursework. But when I think about what it means to be future focused, what it means, to, what will it take to realize our vision? What skills are our students going to need whether they leave here and enter college or career? What do they need to be 21st century essential skills ready and industry standard learning? This is the kind of coursework that we need to start being able to move toward and we need the space to be able to do that. This will give us the ability to expand our pathways to graduation, develop those skills, and level the playing field for our students right now. So right now when you walk down to that space, I don't know if everyone is aware where our technology department currently rests, but it's behind these big walls. This is just outside the middle school gym. There's a vestibule. It's where we conduct our, our voting every, uh, for the past couple of years. And when you walk into this space, I have students every year who aren't even sure how do I get into the technology area. Uh, it's behind this wall. In fact, there's two little doors to get into it currently. If you go through this door here, you're welcomed by this really closed off uh, inner hallway um, that has zero visibility when students are in there. Um, and quite frankly, establishes a little bit of a safety risk in there. So what we are proposing, um, and this is just initial preliminary design um, that Highland had put together for us, is a redesign that takes that first wall, removes that first wall out. This vestibule area is opened, and actually a second set of doors is on the outside of those first doors. So that that really opens up this whole space and removes that. And then it becomes a destination. It becomes a place where students are going to walk by. They will see what's happening within these, these spaces. And they will want to be part of the fabric of what it means to be in there. 
we're really designing a learning space for all students. So if we were to walk through this space, you'll notice from end to end, this is using the existing footprint. Okay, this is, we're not tearing down walls in here. And we've readjusted where teacher A would instruct ideally on the back of this wall here. Again, our goal is to create open, collaborative, work-based spaces for our students with updating our equipment to house plasma cutters, updating and preserving our welding area with a clear through and through with windows all the way into the other space so we can always see what students are working on and it's truly collaborative by nature. As we enter the area that's currently the wood uh, shop area, we're again met with updated CNC routers that speak directly to the computers in those spaces. We're updating our storage, maintaining that paint booth there on the side. And we've dropped windows in here to create a pre-designed fabrication area where we become curators of ideas and brainstorming ideas. And then we can sit down at our CAD stations and use software to bring those ideas to life, which will then in turn talk to our machines right in that space from beginning to end. There's some 3D printers on the side in there. And it also gives the opportunity for teachers from cross-curricular areas who may want to join their classes together, who's working on a project-based, uh, on a real-world topic to solve a problem, and they can come to this destination space to use that to bring their ideas to life. And these are all the pieces that this area and this update um, would provide. Included in this, currently, there's a space right in this part of the room. They have windows right here. Whoa. Uh, that's serving as sort of a makeshift greenhouse area where our current students grow seedlings there and then transplant them into our outside garden beds. One of the pieces that, as we were viewing these areas, the teacher and one of the students said was, it would be so cool if we had a greenhouse. So we said, all right, if that's a request, we'll put it out there for consideration. And so here we are. Um, preliminary concept, if we were to add a greenhouse, it would, in this design here, um, take up some parking spaces. We've also since found that we also have some underground, is that oil, old oil fuel tanks under there? Um, so we might, we would, if that's something the board wants to move forward with, we'd have to kind of go back to the drawing board to consider that. The other piece too is, in order to achieve that, you're kind of breaking the footprint a bit, and there's there's really mixed advice um, or projections on to whether or not state ed approves those um, for aid. So so that that's a that's a component um, that is probably going to be iffy in our ability to do that, um, but. It was requested, so we took a look at it. Then we move on to our transportation garage. Uh, transportation garage needs some love. It's been a while since we've touched that area. Um, that uh, can it used they used to house our or our um, technology in that area a long time ago. Um, some of you may have had classes in there. It could no longer even be considered for an instructional space because some of the um, infrastructure there is so outdated and failed some of our specs every year. Uh, we have this lift that has been repaired a number of times um, that almost every time it's used continues to require repairs, which is really going to be, uh, needs to be a priority item in this project. These areas that you see in black, a lot of these areas every year are starting to fail in that building condition survey and in the annual visual inspection. Um, this is the current uh, break room, for, for lack of a better term, but it's where drivers will come in, punch in, punch out. Um, and that also needs some love. Uh, these are the folks that we are uh, putting our children in the care of every single day and it needs some pretty significant updates in there for your consideration again. 
And then finally, we move to what are areas that touch on all of our students, K through 12. So most of these outdoor areas, in addition to use uh, by physical education, music, arts, and athletics, we look at both interior, what are those programs that touch all kids, and outside of our school, what touch on all of those kids. Carrie and I have both been approached by coaches, by faculty and staff members, by students, by parents, um, questioning what's, what, what's the future of our use of those Legion fields over there um, for, for multi-use facilities. And is there any appetite at all as we move forward in project planning to consider or to put back on the table those instructional spaces and those athletic spaces for our students? Um, the reality is that baseball and softball fields are in tough shape every single year when we get out there to use those. And the long-term relationship between the district and the Legion is always in question year to year as we move forward. Um, but at the same time, we're limited on space here because we're on the side of a hill. Um, it would be way too cost ineffective to start digging into hills. We're not proposing that. But is there an opportunity here to look at some multi-use spaces as technology has developed? So because I've been asked by a number of folks about that, again, it's appearing in blue for your consideration. Auditorium lighting and sound, which again, our students K through 12 use this space for a number of different things. That's also located in the middle of high school scope, which is why it's not repeated here. Um, another piece that I don't have an estimate for yet is uh, a question came up. It would be great to move to make this art gallery another destination space to, um, uh, to present our student artwork K through 12. Um, this is kind of what it looks like now. It's a classroom off the art room in the high school with this wall here in front of it. And so I've been asked that by some students, so we put that in. Um, also, we included the architectural and the CM design in this line because that was not factored uh, previously because these would be newer spaces. And then, of course, the um, contingency costs associated with that. So, I bring us back then to this slide that Kara presented earlier. Everything that I just showed you, we can't do it all. Right now, as presented, that exceeds $14,000. Wouldn't it be great if it was only $14,000? Sign me up, I'm ready for it. Uh, $14 million different story. Uh, anyways, as it currently exists, we can't do everything that I just presented to you. And that's okay, because we have to start somewhere. We know we have a structure now, and we have a timeline, which I'm going to go through in a minute. And then these pieces are back up here, again, for your consideration and also in your packets. But again, I just wanted to be transparent that everything you just saw tonight, we're not going to be able to do it all. So I bring us back to goals of the project and next steps. Again, rounding in the goals, knowing where we're headed, future focus, future ready. And so what happens next? Now it's going to be your turn. Our board is going to start having a conversation about this, followed by a district and community survey and presentations. We'll use that to inform continued refinement of this scope based on feedback. And then throughout the course, just like we did during COVID, we'll be issuing those um, FAQ documents to further enhance everybody's understanding. So what is the big picture overall timeline schedule then look like? We're right here right now. We're engaging in district community board presentation surveys, trying to determine a scope for this next project. <coughs> then uh, toward the end of the year, you've see, we've gone through this process before where we declare as lead agency for the CICRA and begin that review process, accept that negative declaration. And then the board acts. And the board acts on a resolution to approve a final scope and overall budget. And then we establish that referendum or the vote date for this project. This takes us through the summer, where we then we have to issue a 45-day legal notice, followed by one last formal community presentation and hearing, with a goal of going to vote in October of 2023. 
And then following a vote, if that is passed, then we move forward with submitting final plans, submitting everything up to state ed, which we just heard is about eight to 10 week uh, process for approval before we move to pre uh, preparing for bid opening and then moving toward construction ultimately. Uh, it's important that we try to stay within this timeline because of the long-term uh, fiscal implications that we presented earlier. So as we move into and prepare for the work session of this meeting, um, again, we'll be evaluating that current total of construction with consideration for those incidental costs. I just provided a reminder of timeline <coughs> and then review of any of those items that's within the suggestion. <coughs> and of course, our next steps. So before we shift to that, any initial questions? <coughs> Can I borrow one of these folders? <coughs> see this stuff yeah. so within your package you have a copy of the presentation for your reference I also developed this planning worksheet use it if you want you don't have to um, but this is just for those of you who may be a little type A like me and like to have something to to capture my thinking what I've done on here for you is everything that we presented here I've just thrown into a chart this is not a decision. This is just for your planning purposes. There's no catchers to catch what items you might still have questions on and maybe where you currently stand. I won't be collecting these. Nobody's going to be looking at these or evaluating where anybody stands on any of these. It's for your personal use. They won't be graded. They won't be, they won't be graded. Um, this single sheeter, this is the way that Carrie thinks. It's the same information. Um, the only thing that's different on here are the current estimated incidentals and if there are questions on what our not to exceed numbers are related to those incidentals as they're attached to each building within the project, we can certainly answer that for you. We have those numbers as well. So I just need clarification. You're asking for questions right now, like to submit to you, or are we now on, we're not on to the discussion of the project yet, right? Or are we? That's where we're moving. Okay. And so, yep. Yeah, so right now, uh, we're going to provide just an opportunity okay. for the board to start, start that discussion. Okay. But it's fluid, Kim. It's not linear at this point. <coughs> and we are uh, here as facilitators and to answer questions that you might have. I just have a uh, jumping way forward to the vote. I had a question. So when it's when it's voted on, is that um, a majority? It's like vote to, approves it, or does it have to be a certain percentage? No majority. majority. The only time it has to be a percentage above anything is if you have a debt ceiling or if you're a central school that. Is, yeah. So, so, in, so okay. you have the if you go sixty percent, or if you exceeded your debt ceiling. We're not even close. Not even close. Okay. Thank you. No, just 50 plus one. I jotted a lot of things down. You want me just to start? I don't know what to start talking. This is your time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I look at some of the things as far as I'm under middle school, high school, or wherever, we're doing um, like sidewalk walk repair or step repair. I just want to. Are we also considering, if we dig that up and replace it, I mentioned this one other time, considering if lighting, need, any additional lighting needs to be put in there as well while it's dug up? Is there anything that needs to be run to have additional? That's all, I'm just curious. Front steps, we've discussed that. Yeah. That's where, the, that's where I think the only discussion as far as sidewalks at just, this point okay. have been is lighting. We talked about lighting, I think, underneath the steps and along mm -hmm. the sides. The ones that go down to where you park your yes. car? Yes. And that's the one, Kim, if you remember, that we approved moving forward on the emergency project. Okay. For. That's I, not in this I project. Right, right. All right. So to answer your question, in this project that's being proposed, there's not lighting on the sidewalks there because it's captured in and, the and emergency process. Because it's not needed, right? Is that Correct. Right? Okay. Thank yes. you. Okay, thank you. Go for it. Am I the only one? That's because I missed you guys. I haven't seen you in so long. Maybe you got caught up on things before I wasn't here. Um, so 
So as far as the technology agriculture innovative lab area, mm -hmm. I know it's not, um, everything's not set in stone and figured out, but do you have any idea at this point if there will be any staffing increase or decrease for that area? Um, I just wrote a ton of stuff down. No, that's fine. No, and staffing implications is a great question. So if you recall, we currently do have an open position, um, you know, that, that footprint. And the intent is that that will be filled. We've, we've posted that as a business computer teacher. We've posted that as a um, technical science teacher. Now we're having conversations about technical math because we looked at the crosswalks of state certifications for somebody ultimately who will be able to teach this type of industry thinking and applied thinking. And so the vision is for that person to work hand in hand with the existing technology teacher whose fr primary strengths are in the ag area to work together in that space and to be able to teach that other coursework that we're looking to move toward. Okay. Another question I or thought I had or whatever is, what, so we're talking about some of these other programs adding to the same area I'm talking about. So is there any um, additional benefit to the students when they graduate? For example, like if they went to BOCES or if they went to uh, Delhi Tech, instead, would they, so if they did these programs here, would they get any type of certification or licensing of any kind when they leave our school to like benefit them to just leave here and go to a, a welding job or go to something like that? I was curious. So our, our goal is always to provide kids with the experiences that they're going to need when they leave us, right? And so some of the examples of how we've already done that is in that our Future Focus Career Experience Program is one example of that. Um, when we look at how we are, the ability to expand pathways to graduation and how we think about that, and so what coursework do we need to have in there before we can even apply to the state for other, for what you're talking about. Well, because I'm curious, like if, like if BOCES or Delphi Tech are offering these programs, and certain, maybe not all the students, but if certain students have an opportunity to go take it at BOCES or Delphi mm -hmm. Tech and actually leave there with their certificate or license or whatever they need to just leave high school and go to these jobs. I mean, that's a huge advantage. I just didn't know. Sure. Do it here I, I think there. that this will give us potential to do that down the road. Yeah, that would be great. But the initial goal is just to give our kids the experience of how do I learn in a collaborative space with other people okay. where we're sharing ideas and where we're researching and we're creating, right? It's giving those, some people call them soft skills, I prefer to call them essential skills, okay. um, to prepare our students for what they will experience when they go to the workplace or to college. Okay. Um, Can I just add a piece? Yeah, we were in Niscus <clears throat> last month, <clears throat> spoke to a district, local district, who just kind of did a whole run through of their tech wing and did kind of what we're talking about right now. And so my question was talking about some of the machinery. We were talking about CNC cutters and laser cutters and things like that. And the story ended up talking that Amphenol has the same units that the school has. So Amphenol's coming in, experts from there are coming in and helping these kids set up these machines, working with them, teaching them design. And those kids are leaving that school and going to work directly for Amphenol. I mean, they, right. that's just kind of like a little side story of like preparing kids for local jobs. And I just thought it was a really nice piece. It wasn't that, all right, now we're going to think that they're going to leave here or anything like that. It's all local. So the industry is working with these districts that have this type of technology. Um, and maybe you don't know these answers, but so. In that area, that new technology ag area, do you like about how many students would it hold, or like how many different classes would you anticipate at one time? Or no, we don't know this yet. Like to, we're we just trying to picture out what it would look like. With I, I don't have a number off the top of your head. However, the way that it's currently laid out, again, we're not changing the footprint. Yeah. But theoretically, you can have a class in the traditional agriculture side, you can have class in that woodshop side, right. and you could have a smaller class in that fabrication okay. area simultaneously. There's a there's large enough footprint. Do I know the exact capacity in those okay. spaces? I don't, that's you, that's but yeah, I, that's the vision. That would be, that's great. Um, 
then I just have a couple questions about um, sports things. So under a soft cost where you have multi-use field, can you, and there's like $2 million, but what is that, what is that? What is multi-use field? So that is a field that's a fabricated field or like a turf field. So oh, so it's not, we don't have it yet. We don't have okay. it. No, 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 no. So, so it would be like a football field. field. You would take that current field. The football yeah. field. Into so soccer. And you would turn that into that. Worry about yes. So because, because, yep. And yep. softball could use it too? Or no, the softball, so, okay. So I guess just elaborate on that a little more then. So if we, if we, that's the plan to budget for that right now in this project? No, we there's, no plan, there's no plan. There's no plan right okay, now. So that's, that's on the right. table for us to decide. But what that correct? What that is referring to is because we don't because the future of the use of fields at the Legion is right. tentative. Right. Um, the potential proposals with the existing footprint to develop a synthetic field that can be used for multiple sports. Okay. And that's how they're making them Very now, so that they're aligned for multiple sports. Okay. Um, and then secondary to that is an, another option where there have been soccer fields with an overlay for softball as well. So again, with the goal of being able to regain local control over those spaces for multiple uses. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah so, I, I, there's, I just see, there's so many more. It's kind of like the sports, the number of kids going out for sports is now, I saw, I thought it was dwindling, and now it's like so many kids. I mean, like 30, 40 mm -hmm. <laughs> kids going, you know, on teams. And it's, it's so obviously it's, it's um, you know, it's huge. And it's what families want, it's what kids want. And I know, um, that's why I wanted clarification on that, because just with my son playing modified football right now, my family's had the opportunity to go to other um, schools and man we just some of the fields um like all the facilities like you go to some of the schools around here and it's like they have this that's what i'm saying like my family and i had a talk recently i was like we don't have the space for this you know we don't have the land like right here where you can stand at a football field and then over there you see the gorgeous baseball field or over you know what i mean we don't have that space here so yeah maybe this is a solution I, you know I, I just that's why i didn't understand what it was but okay i just need a little more clarification so is that one or the other like the multi-soccer football field that's going to be okay. up to you again we're just giving you information on which to to kind of whittle down and start making decisions if we went for the soccer football <coughs> Field, could that modified field become like a softball? What's the modified that's field? That's where you're talking. Oh. That's what we're talking field. about. You're talking lower oh. field? That's yes. Yes, that's why there's two separate line items there. Again, this is not, again, we're not yeah. <clears throat> we're just giving you the information. One of the things that we kind of talk about a lot too is, and this comes to my office, it comes to Kelly's office a couple times a year, why aren't we doing anything with the Legion fields? We don't own those fields. We get zero dollars. Whatever money we put into them, you get nothing back as far as aid. The other issue, too, you could put the half a million dollars into those fields and lose those fields tomorrow. Or next year, the Legion says, and I'm not saying that in a bad way, but the Legion may say, listen, we're kind of done with this. We're, and they're, it's theirs. So, you know. That's, that's the issue we kind of run into. So we're kind of looking for softball was a big thing, I know, spring of last year, baseball fields. How much do you put into them with taxpayer dollars? And get, you know, what do you get back out of it? And that's what we're trying to, that's, again, just trying to throw it out there to say, listen, these are options. Um, it may be difficult down the road as we try to maintain these fields as, as much as we do now. So, and I'm not saying these fields, I'm talking about the Legion fields. So, so after, Tonight, I'm trying to find look at I'm getting the heads on the calendar. I guess I guess what do we do? There'll be more I, work sessions. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, this yeah, is just a scratch yeah. the surface. Okay. This is yeah. just Thank a you. first okay. blush, just Thank to you. get you information. Okay. No decisions need to be made today. <laughs> These are big decisions, so absolutely. Okay. Um, and we see a lot more information on like something like overlaying a, a soccer field for soccer. You know what I mean? I just need, need to do that's all I just yeah so after tonight we'll be putting out a community survey okay. um, with a lot of people
PR around that to try to increase the number of people that are responding. We will have public meetings where members of our community can come and provide input and ask questions just as just like we're doing here tonight. And then we'll come back uh, to subsequent, we can either schedule special board meetings or have this as a regularly occurring item on uh, regular board meetings. I'm gonna guess we're probably gonna need to do both in order to stay in this timeline. And throughout all of that, if you're seeking additional information or wanna throw other things you know, in or eliminate pieces, that's what, that's the work that you'll be doing. So, Karen and I are gonna take a seat. Uh, we remain here for um, resources to continue to ask questions for you. I just need to grab my water. Um, and certainly uh, our folks from Highland and the Chase are here to answer specific questions as well. Can you guys stand up a minute just for, for our newer board members who might not know who you are. Um, and so, um, David Degnan, Hey, David, uh, from Highland Architects, accompanied by David Gilmore, who is perhaps a more familiar face to you, and then uh, Corey Coyne is with LaChase, our construction management firm. So thank you guys for being here tonight um, and for the work they've already put in to inform some of this, and um, they uh, are at our disposal as well. That falls under one of the contingency items. Which uh, on the back of the carry page, under soft costs, that's where you see uh, equipment, furniture for that tech room. Um, and, uh, and other soft costs that are associated within that. Um, those are very, very rough estimates. Um, Has there been any, um, do any of our local businesses know that if this is something that we've been thinking about and have they expressed any interest in being involved? So I didn't hear you. Have any like our local businesses, if they were aware of what we were doing, if they had any, you know, in, in, right? And so they are aware that we are in the initial stages of planning this. Um, I've intentionally not shared a ton of detail because I didn't know what direction the board wanted to go. So I have not solicited partnerships or donations or you know anything from industry as far as that goes. Um, because we're just still in that preliminary phase. I know the, the comments Carrie had earlier um, yeah. were kind of exciting to think about. <clears throat> My mind is kind of big on this. Um, at one point, we had a drainage problem by, by the elementary school, and, and that was causing like a sinkhole type of thing. Um, do you remember that in, that in the lot? Carrie would, yeah. lot. Carrie would probably know that too. Who's mm -hmm. leaving though? Was that being taken care of? It's right there. It's elementary parking. Maybe. Corey, do you? This is, so we did preliminary boring. Remember I had mentioned right. we done some boring up there to determine that the sub base in the elementary parking lot. And yes, some of that was um, attributed to that piece. Corey, how much of CWC was able to redirect and, and address that drainage coming down off that hill? We were able to address behind the elementary school. We put a whole oh, that swale, swale right? in. We cleaned it out with the installment. Um, there was still some water issues there. We did some borings. Um, we put a square foot number to the parking lot to address the drainage in that area. So that when we go to do the project, we can address anything that we um, find in that area for the water issues. So, so the long term, the water issue is resolved. Okay. So anything new that we put in there should not be compromised by that necessarily. That's, that was my question. That being said, 
water always finds a way. Um, but yeah, that, that was the plan. We just couldn't afford to do the extent of paving in the project we just did. Right, and I remember somebody saying, well, that's for our next project. So yes, and here we are. Yeah, that's what I was looking to it. Is there anything, um, maybe it already happened, did anything, is there still the ox gym? Yes. Is there any plan to do anything with that? Or We use that all the time currently. Yeah, I just didn't know. During COVID, we used a lot of that for storage. There's not, but yeah. over the summer, it's it is fine. updated. It's nothing, it doesn't need anything, it's good? It's it's in good condition. Okay. They have a batting cage in there okay. currently. Oh, okay. uh, we use it in the evenings. Uh, he stepped out. Uh, in the evening, yeah, pickleball is in there every night using it. Um, we use that then structurally, so yeah. yeah. So the bed cage from Clark Companies is in there? That's where that, no. No, no, it's a, it's a drop down practice one. Oh. Yeah, so not the one that was installed in the Legion. All right. The middle school and um, high school, it's a random uh, testing, uh, read, yeah, read on, read on uh, testing. Uh, didn't we test that when we did the sub basement? Or do you know when we did the asbestos uh, abatement? When we did we the also basement. tested for radon when we were down there in the basement. I don't think radon was there. That was not radon. No. Yeah. No. no. I don't think we brought it up. I have a whole bunch of questions, Kelly. Um, but it's they're probably for people all over the place here, but we got everybody here, so it's yeah, no, that's why they're here. First one is is timeline. I just want to get a little bit more of an understanding on that. Is Carrie back? He's not back. No. He put, um, he, I think Will Elsie took him out there to ask questions, but whoops. <laughs> but Will doesn't get him right now. <laughs> all right, well, I'll come back to the timeline when we come sure. back in. Um, do you, in this technology um, center, you listed, and the, there were a lot of interesting ideas that we would have in that technology center listed there. Um, are they things that students would no longer have to travel to POSIs to do? Not necessarily, um, Seth. It does not replicate um, the specialized facilities and outcomes that Kim was referring to, that CTE, the accredited CTE programs that OCs currently offer. It doesn't give us, it would not give us the ability necessarily to go as deeply or in, or in, the, uh, in all of the areas of CTE that OCs offers. Um, but what it does do is prepare our students for when they enter those kind of programs. Now, potentially with the right teacher and right equipment, there are opportunities to extend our CT offerings here. So does that mean that we could move to a full-blown CTE welding program? Probably not. It would not have as many booths as would be necessary or the correct certification necessarily to do that. Um, but could it offer a CTE pathway in something beyond agriculture? Um, potentially. But we just don't know no, that long right. term. But the intent was not was never to be a one for one. I'm, I'm thinking back to what Tammy said a little, a little bit about what Carrie said, and that um, I think it would be exciting to explore with our local businesses um, go further into okay, we're considering this. Mm -hmm. What um, specifically? Are you seeing is now and as the future so we can prepare and what a neat way to develop a pipeline and that may be you know there's a few organizations like that that we could from Saputo to Clarks to Sportsfield and all of those <coughs> so I, I would think that would be a valuable conversation to have we will have an opportunity for that conversation on November 3rd I just uh, worked with Ray Pucci at our Chamber of Commerce uh, they post the business after hours now on a weekly or bi-weekly basis and I've just solidified with him that they will be hosting one here on November 3rd where we'll be providing the presentation that we gave in our last board meeting on our future focused 
Career Explorations Program. And we'll be opening our doors to all kinds of local business people to come in and see what we're doing in terms of connecting our current students with internships uh, in our community in various industries. So that's a, a perfect opportunity for that kind of conversation. Would you maybe want to have a separate technology oh, forum? Oh, you God, know, where awesome. it was, because I can see that going a lot of places. But oh, yeah. do you want to maybe target people to really make sure we get in there? I mean, that, we have some great examples here. So I'm just trying to think of a way to, that input would seem to be really valuable to get to that. What Perry said about that. The amphenol example and that yeah. linkage to what the school does. You know, I, I kind of think it would be good to do and see what comes of it. Um, explain to them what we're considering and see what see who they would send and how it would happen. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is with the survey, would we present it in a way that gave some narrative? Um, to what the thinking is behind each of the components to give the context for people because you know you know when you pick up a survey um, should I widen Route 28 going down Mount? A lot of open interpretation. Yeah I mean maybe I haven't been on that road in 30 years I don't think there's a problem with it but if somebody told me there were 45 head-on collisions on that corner that may help me inform what decision I may make. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm just saying, can we, you probably will do this, but I just want to make sure that you give people context that they're not as close to it as what we are. Because we read the survey a certain way. People that aren't around us every day may not know the value of those, you know, let's take the technology, right, of each of those components and how that relates to where we're moving to and sure. what we need. Sure. Okay. And I've already started to do that somewhat in the narrative if I, as I've just preliminary started to put this together. But just like with other surveys that we've done, I'll share that with all of you first for your feedback mm -hmm. uh, before that goes out. Great. The, the other grade. thing I was going to suggest is a student survey. Mm -hmm. Because I think if that it would be a good data point to... Separate create, from yeah, the Yeah, separate to one. gauge what our students are thinking. What do you guys think of that? I think that's right. Like yeah. You know, I, I love the input that you bring to us at the meetings. Mm -hmm. This would be a great way to expand that and get information about what the perception is of our student body. That I think it's really valuable. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It would be kind of neat if there was a way to include maybe the last couple years graduates to see what their perspective. I wish you had this, or I wish I'd been able to do this. But I think that probably would be pretty difficult to do. Um, I'm looking at Carter and Tyler here. <laughs> Thank you both for coming tonight, by the way. Um, that's awesome. Uh, is that something you guys would be willing to work out with me on? Mm -hmm. Great. Well, even before the, I know that I'm not. I no, you're okay, go ahead. <laughs> but even before the meeting started, Carter and I were saying that, like, even though these things won't be here for us, we said those words, this would be so cool if we could have had this, and it would be cool if this opportunity is for other students. Yeah, I know my uh, sister, who's president of FFA, would be jumping up and down right now if she <laughs> saw this. <laughs> yeah, she'd think this is awesome. Uh, I mean, just to that, this is just a great way to get students, I think I think this is just an awesome way to get students involved and ready, like you said, because uh, we have no way of doing, uh, preparing for like ar uh, architecture or engineering on computers and things, I think that'll break this will bring us up to date and uh, everything we do in the science and agriculture side. My uh, last question is about going back. I think Carrie, you're back, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so back to the Carrie, timeline. <coughs> 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 back to the uh, the timeline. So we you presented. A, a thought for a vote um, about a year from now in the fall of 2023 and shortly thereafter we would have it ready to go to SED for what's now you said 10 weeks what did you say nine, nine, ten. okay so call it three months or something like that right so it could be back maybe by the first of the year around there something like that 
prior just a long, long time, and what we just saw in this project was it just gets so turbulent the further out you get from when you estimated it. So I just, I want to look more at the timeline, I guess, just to see if that really what needs to be two years. Uh, no. No, about a couple weeks. Yeah, well, they're 45 days. It's not. Oh, so third party. That's the SCP's not approving it, they're going to push it out right. to another architect, a third party, but you're not going to gain a lot from that. You know, a lot, of, it, we ran into a couple, and, and it, it, you're right, it's two years, it, it really is a tough thing because it, the timeline it takes a long time. It, this one, too, was even worse than the fact that when we had a big climate, we went out late, and the bids came in too high. We right. scrapped them, had to wait. And that created, you know, and that, created more <clears> than late. Then you had COVID, you know what I mean? Right. It was kind of like all this stuff happening. Um, but, and when yeah. you get into the um, you know the architectural drawing phases and the engineering design phase, the number of times that we go back and forth with the drawings and that kind of thing to refine that all adds to the timeline too, because then you're at the mercy of engineers and the architects who are doing that work to then bring that back to us um, before that's submitted to state that. The only so, way to make significant gains would be to have a push your vote back. But then you're looking at compressing this, these discussions and planning it. You know that's 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 the only way to really gain. Right. Mm -hmm. You're still going to have a tough time getting the summer. I mean, a, a summer before 25. Even if you push the vote back, it's still for construction. Yeah. Or what you mentioned, maybe starting. I mean, and I, I don't want to get down too far on this. Point. We're just talking, and we don't know the scope. But are there things that could be done with? If there's a possibility to do something that's an isolated, you know, area, if yeah, we're to do an addition, can you, you know, close that off and not be able to do that at school? You know, some of those kinds. Of or outside, you know, this parking lot. Could, yeah. could that start in March? I don't know. I, I don't know. The field. You know, those right. What, what could be done, addition to HVAC work. I don't know. I don't, that's what I just wonder how much mm -hmm. I think hitting that summer is just going to slow well. But yeah, we moved all the cafeteria, didn't we? We did. We did. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Okay, so timeline is one. I know we'll continue to talk about it, but it's, I think we have to be sensitive to it based on our last experience. Um, I think that's it for now. Thanks. We've got some money in the elementary school for safety and security. What is that? Um, that's cameras, safety security system. So some of the pieces, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I meant to mention that earlier too. There are some components in here that we've been having parallel conversations on regarding other sources of funding for. Um, we're looking at Smart Schools Bond Act potentially for a lot of those cameras. We're looking at the next iteration of um, emergency relief funds, uh, potentially for for much less than in the current the project we just finished, but um, for other opportunities. Um, we are looking at a potential RFP for EPC, the Energy Performance Contract, that could potentially pick up some of this scope. Uh, but again, we want it to be transparent in all the work regardless of where it eventually lands, that's within consideration, just so we could come to you with a ballpark idea of dollar amounts that we're really talking about. Low so, low but low yes, low safety and security, low 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 down strokes. strokes. Something we did have in the project. This last project got pulled, right. um, and that's basically to alert people when we're in a lockdown, so in the building. Um, exterior, right, exterior <coughs> strokes. A lot of our exterior cameras 
So when I look at this, that I think that's all I saw for safety and security. Mm -hmm. Is that all we need? Well, the elementary building, if I'm not mistaken, was done in the 2013 project. The entrance way? Uh, yes, it was. The entrance way yes, was done was. in that. Great, yes. I mean, one of the things we have, we have, we talked about this, you know, the next level would be panic switches, but we currently only have one point of entry in each building. Okay. Main office here, main office over here. So, and there's multiple ways, you know, you can't get through just one door into the office, you gotta go through two. So we didn't really, you know, we looked at that. That was about all that we had. For, I mean, more cameras than anything else. I mean, those cameras are almost 10 years old, I think. Quite frankly, most people don't go into the second set of doors. Um, yeah, it's kind of a McDonald's type window uh, <laughs> that, that Rhonda opens and, and talks to and, and passes paperwork and cupcakes and all those types of things. Uh, right through that window, um, and, and there's no need for people to be in the building. So honestly, I, I, I feel really fairly safe in, the, in that building. We record all of our doors. We record, yes. Um, we record all of our doors, our hallways, um, around the perimeter. And, and it's very funny, too. This happens on a regular basis. If somebody walks behind that building, Every teacher on that hallway <laughs> where that person is walking is, is on our phone. Our phones can't keep up with as fast as they call us. There's somebody on the property that should, there's, we don't know who this is. There's a guy back here, and I go out, and inevitably it's somebody who's gotten off the trail or whatever, but you know, they're, they're very alert, very alert in that building. So they, they have to be. Think yeah, a situation where you have that, or you have somebody here. We have all the cameras here, and we're planning for more cameras. Would we have the ability to see all them to at once on a big screen? So there's all we do now. We do now. Yes. Okay. So I think one of the things that Chris and I were talking about just the other day is the fact that we have them, but we don't all have access to it. I mean, there's technology now. We were saying I think you can pull it up on your phone, you know. And so instant, but you know now we have to kind of go speak with IT or we look at it ourselves and then have to isolate the time frame and find the camera, find the view. We can I mean do like it. real time. <clears throat> yes. yes. You can go to your office. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes. That's good. When they're all working. We still have, you know, that's the other thing, Smart School Bond app, you know, we have 760,000 sitting in that still that we haven't tapped. So that's an area where you can't have all of funding. A lot of times you want to look at trying to Correct me if I'm wrong, something for that aligns with a project so that you have the, the funding up front. What happens with smart school funding is you have to pay for it up front, then you get the money back. Mm -hmm. So the line with the project so you can take out short term borrow borrowing yes. and then tap your general fund and then get your aid back. Back. Right. Right. So as we progress along that alignment note. You'll hear us continuing to come to the board and discuss EPC, you know, RFP for the energy performance contract, and continue discussions of smart schools um, with capital project, just for that reason. If we're running all of those in parallel, then that increases our ability to maintain where those, those funds are, are overlapping, ultimately reaping the cost savings of that in the end, um, and our ability to have our, the guts of our buildings open simultaneously um, and capture that overlap where that's possible. Kelly, a um, couple of things I jotted down. Um, one was next to the safety and security on each DIP building you have uh, hazardous materials in a relatively low numbers. Um, can you speak to that? So that's always an assumption for, you know, if we open up a wall and run into asbestos um, or anything preliminarily, it's, it's always recommended to have a cushion in there for those kind of contingency situations. That's primarily what that's referring to. Uh, Dave, can you expand on that at all? No, it's just something that you have to be, be aware of. You have a present in the buildings, uh, so you need to plan for it. Uh, it just depends on what part of the building you touch as to how much you're going to be able to get into. 
of course, the scope is defined and you can do your testing and find out exactly what it's going to cost. So, it's always a good place to have that. Yeah. So, in one, in the, <coughs> under middle school, high school, it, it, it has hazardous material slash radon testing. In the um, elementary and bus garage buildings, it doesn't include that radon testing. Actually, I think that was just an oversight in transcribing into these areas. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, that wasn't, there, there's not an assumption that it's needed in one area, not another. Okay. Um, in your presentation, you've mentioned a couple of times the BCS and the ABI. Yes. Um, is that something we can be made available to the board? Of course. For review, I, I, I can't recall seeing it in the past. It's a while ago. We did one, I think, four years ago. Yeah. The last building condition. <coughs> yep. We can pull that back out. Um, Over the last couple of years, I'd say, uh, we, you know, we've had a capital project committee. We've met, I've presented to the full board that we're meeting and we're discussing and we're anticipating planning for these projects. And I think on a couple of times we've talked about planning for not only this next project, but the project after that. Um, and there was numbers associated, you know, just general numbers. You know, this one would be a three or four million. The next one might be six, six or eight million. Um, and I think in the planning, we had talked about um, the technology wing being part of not this next small project, but the subsequent project. Now this presentation lumps those two together, and I. I just want to clarify to the board that's what's happening here. So this, you know, I've said we're planning a three or four million dollar project, and now it's snowballed. It, it's because of that that we've meshed, uh, apparently meshed these two, and then included a whole bunch of things that we have not yet really talked about, and that being the outdoor, the fields. Um, that's even new to me as recent as last week. Um, so I just want to make that clear. Um, two for one. <coughs> as far as other sources of uh, potential funding, I think CWC has got to be kept in the, it, 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 as an option for any kind of drainage. And when those things come up, they will pay for that. That's something we need to keep in mind. Um, that I had some questions about the, the survey or in my mind thinking through how that might work. Uh, I think not only the student input would be beneficial, but making sure that we're reaching out to the to all the stakeholders in the district, um, not just the parents and not just you know, the parents of just current students, but. No, absolutely. Um, and, and, and and I don't know if that's, you know, a public notice in the papers or a mailing or a, oh. all of the above potentially or social media, you know. That's we want to capture as much of that public input as possible. Mailing would be, <clears throat> mailing would be difficult. It's expensive. I mean, I think we have other means of, of reaching out to the stakeholders. That would be. Have we, I, yeah. I think we have, but I'm not sure. We've done, when we've done surveys in the past, if there are, have we ever had paper copies that people could come pick up? Or, no, they've always been electronic. Okay. Okay. We've had paper ones available in the district that if somebody calls and says, yeah. I need a paper one, maybe we do something like that. We send it out, or yeah. people have come to pick it up. But okay. you know, by and large, it's when they haven't been able to access the electronic mode. Okay. So I'm going to get back to um, <coughs> to uh, clarify a little bit what Sean was talking about earlier. Um, 
the initial inception, as, as we discussed in the last capital project meeting, was, was just that. We've been talking about, um, well, let me back up. When we were first talking about long-term long sustainability of projects, our initial conversations with fiscal advisors was, okay, what are the next few size projects that we can be looking at that keep us in that cycle of healthy debt? And so for a while, we were conceptualizing like a $3.5 million project now, followed by a like $7, 8000000 million project next. When we looked at all of the, and with every project, of course, you're looking at all of those contingency fees being separated. So as Carrie and I sat down to look at a little more uh, discreetly that cycle of debt falling off and coming back on, we quickly realized we have may have the potential here to combine these projects, especially because we felt the sense of urgency, particularly around that instructional space in the technology area. Quite frankly, we can't afford to wait another eight years to level the playing field for our students when it's, we will be twice as much behind if it comes to fruition then. So we went back to fiscal advisors, said, what would it look like if we did combine these into a 10, 12, $14 million project now? And there was cost savings represented there in the contingency costs and the preparation of the plans um, and in those kind of things. And quickly realized that we can still do that uh, with an application of reserves that was even less than what we applied in this current project with the ability to capture more in that scope. Um, in early discussions, uh, we did talk about the future of our athletic facilities and what might that look like. Um, it, 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 the onus of responsibility to bring what we presented to you today did not fall solely on the Capital Project Committee, however, um, as Sean was speaking to before. We had peep things in here very possibly that uh, certainly people who weren't on the Capital Project Committee or on the Finance Committee um, had been privy to. So again, it came from a number of different sources that, that we are offering. Uh, to you today. So that's a little bit about why we had moved from two smaller projects to one project. I'm going to state this to that? <clears throat> Actually, this came from the chase. We started talking about the tech wing. We were talking about paving at the same time. Oh, yeah. Corey made this point of <clears throat> you probably don't want to pay if in seven, eight years you're going to do a tech wing because you're going to chew up that parking lot again. So we started talking, we had a little bit more of a conversation about mobilization costs. Right. And saying, well, wait a minute, if we're gonna, you know, and we can't put the parking lot or the paving off for seven years because we're waiting for another project. And that's kind of where we started. And as far as a project goes, we just decided, we sat down to say, okay, what would we put into a project and building that project? And, and Kelly's right, there's some things in here that we haven't talked to anyone about. We talked about it with David Sissio, we talked about it a little with the architects just to say, all right, if this was a placeholder, what would this cost? Mm -hmm. So again, it's just kind of building this framework. It doesn't have to be the size of the building. It doesn't have to be the, the design. It's, it's simple startup framework. That's all it is. So that's where that kind of came up too. Uh, mobilization costs, you're going to mobilize to do one thing, and then five years down the road, you're going to pay for it again. So that's why we decided. We looked at the finance side of it and said, wow, this is a lot more obtainable than we thought. What would it look like if we went with a larger project? And I think it's important to keep, um, I'm thinking of the, the tower, but as it goes along with everything, to keep the, I'm not sure what the word I want, the identity of the, the traditional um, aesthetics, right, mm -hmm. I think, in everything, just to keep that aligned with everything that we're, we're looking to do. Because that's always kind of been a- Some of the actual tower? Noted. The, 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 the dome in the part. Design, that's in the, that's in the, the blue right now. That's the not traditional look of the that's building. A, it is, it's because it's not something that we actually said, okay, we're definitely going to okay. do. That's again, it's one of these things that right. well, looking at it, listen, we can't probably go 10 years without that thing, maybe have right. a lot bigger issues than what it does now. You know, so that's why. But as an example, again, I, really that, I don't want to say, oh, too expensive. Let's take it off, take it off. <laughs> <laughs> because that's kind of part 
Well, you know, if, if yeah. that's starting to leak also, now you're going into the bell tower area, now you're going down below, so yeah. it all kind of trickles down below. Literally. <laughs> So I have a question here. So let's say we're looking at a fourteen million dollar project. You got two thousand two million dollars from debt reserve and seventy three point three percent from the state coming back. That leaves almost a two million dollar deficit. Where is that money from? Seventy three point three percent would be ten point four million reimbursed. Two two million would put us up to twelve, so we're we're short. But you're also having debt fall off. So you're not, it's not, again, we're not, these are preliminary numbers, but uh, it's all based upon, we have, you also have debt falling off next year. And then you have debt falling off again in four years, five years, I'm sorry. So you're again, it's not that we're putting money, I don't want to explain this. $14 million project. We're looking at more of how do we sustain budget to budget also. So again, you're right. still going to have a local share of a little bit, but it's not changing budget to budget each year. When we look at the debt, we look at it long term. Mm -hmm. We're looking at it to make sure. So there may be a little bit of a local share, which there is still a local share within the budget. Those In our regular projects. budget, exactly. what is right? What goes toward our regular cycle of debt to start with? Right is assumed in that. So in order to maintain our current payments, if you will, that we pay off on those loans, right. in order to achieve a $14 million project, it's an additional $2 million out of the um, debt reserve to offset that. So it's not a linear one for one. Be easier. I can show the district. I can show the board. I don't have it in front of me. Is the actual financial summary and this the local share calculation that fiscal puts together? We can go from. But it's not. Well, what you're saying is it's not an additional two million because we're the debt. We have some debt going away. Right. So this just takes that spot. Yeah, I mean you're always looking year to year to right. look at where there's some indebtedness. That's what you're looking at and trying to figure out because you don't again want those spikes happening right. here and there. So yes, there's a little bit of a local share there, but that's still maintaining yeah. within the budget. Right. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, but <clears throat> I think it's much easier if we can get it to the point. How, so we've got these numbers. How accurate would you say they are? Because it's just from our you know, capital project meetings, they're very different. There's some things that are very different from our last meeting. So far, you're right. No, so the scope is almost nothing right now. You have to put contingencies on to, to be able to uh, you know, come close to what the budgets could be. Um, so it's you know, a, a, a wild guess, you know, somewhat educated just based on what things are happening right now as far as construction costs go, and then guessing what's going to happen in the future. Um, so. You know, either, I think it's reasonable to start in place, but as you develop drawings further, you know, they'll become much and much more accurate as you go up throughout the process. So some of those are square foot based off like the technology based off the square foot price of the typical technology room that we might have done last year or two. So it's just a rough number of square foot price that we have in our SMA department to put together until we get that final design like Dave said that has a specific scope to it of exactly what's happening. Trying to put a real number to it. So we just use a, a conservative number, square foot number, if you have the technology. Um, the greenhouse, just use conservative numbers. So, in all of our conversations up until now, again, this is not always the way that it's done, but we've tried to give us numbers just as a point of reference. So early on, we were, we were pulling numbers. Carrie was sifting through like the 2013 and the 2020 planning project, pulling numbers from there just to have a footprint, just to have a conversation to give us a ballpark idea. Here's an example, the lift in the garage. Somebody said, oh, that's probably gonna be about $45,000. Well, it's not, it's $250,000, okay? So in one of the early, in one of the early iterations, you're 
you're right that we talked to capital project committee and i think finance committee on we probably had a, a holder in there for 45 40 45 thousand dollars so now as we have gotten closer we want it to be understanding that these are just kind of placeholders we wanted to get somewhat at least into left field with some of these estimates so as recently as yesterday we were continuing to get figures back um, in order to present that to you today and so yes in some areas based on even i guess less rough estimates those numbers have shifted and changed will they continue to absolutely once we start to discuss and narrow down really what we want to focus on, then we can really put these guys to work and say, all right, this is the direction the board wants to go. We're serious about this. We're no longer going to look into this. And let's continue to fine tune those numbers. When we started the three, three and a half million dollar project, we were using numbers from the chase, I think, from like March of last year also. So we were, again, it wasn't it's set in stone. Yep. All right, we think it's going to be around this amount. Okay, let's just get uh, let's get some placeholders in there to see where it tallies up to a three to three and a half million dollar project. Even speaking with Corey yesterday, bid contingencies are higher. I mean, we just talked about it. it used to be one and a half, now it's seven and a half due to materials and labor and things like that. So, and it will change again. There's no doubt. So the and we, I was just going to say we we can assume that just because we're out of COVID, that those are going to drop down to pre-COVID numbers either. To elaborate on Kelly's uh, conversation about the bus lift, we just put one and done in another district. It's roughly two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the lift. Now we don't know if we can put a lift on that concrete or if we have to remove the concrete, put new concrete in. If we have to supply new power to it, that's all stuff that the architect will design once we get a scope together and we start putting things together and doing their investigation. That's something that they have a lot us know what we need to do, so we can put a dollar value to it. We just base that off of one that we've already done in another, in another building. Another area, um, I see we, back to the HVAC, I know we had considered at one time making some changes to HVAC in different zones in the building. And we went down that road and came to a point where we were told that the electrical in the old part of the building would not support it. And that was one of those, it was before we started the project, but it was one of those, oh, should we have known that our electricity was antiquated? And I'm wondering if that is still a true statement or if that is in this part of the building specifically is our electrical service where it needs to be to keep up with the times here or and I think it was even said you know we have some very old service here in some places so I, I don't know whether that's included in that number because it was connected at that point or if that's just something that there was going back to the building the condition survey in the last project but I think what you're referring to is if you're counting on the electricity in this building to air condition the building I don't think you can so it, I think our conversation was not electricity at that point, it was controls. No, different. No, different. Okay. This, was, this was back, we had a bunch of people come and tell us that certain parts of the building got above a temperature that was <coughs> at all feasible to have students in rooms and people were leaving classrooms and going to other classrooms. The whatever middle school library space had so much exposure that that, and I don't know if that's one that had an HVAC that was down. Sure. I just remember electrical service was a concern. It could not support the flexibility to do additional zoning of HVAC. HVAC. What's that? There's no reason why to say without whatever cost is associated with it, you could provide what you need to air condition the building. Yeah, I don't mean really necessarily even air conditioning the building per se, like the whole thing. I'm just saying there were identified zones that were because of their southern exposure or proximity to the kitchen or whatever. I can't remember. It's a that's, while. That's but just, a tough one to, to pick and choose rooms who's going to air condition. So no, I'm getting it. It's not. Get into those I, I, I have not heard of 
lack of infrastructure to be able to support the demand that we place on our electrical use. Conversations that I've been privy to have just surrounded controls, but if that was, um, I'm not aware of it. But it's a question we'll. It's and this a one's true. This one's so, so we <clears throat> we did this last project. <clears throat> there was a discussion about using train, um, and at that point it was there at the events, which we went. And I'll admit I was the one that said we're going to, you know, feel good about staying with train and doing things that, you know, staying with them as far as unit event um, replacement. Some of the they were replacing some controls. They had promised us that they would be able to marry all of the controls together, um, and they have not come through with that. And that wasn't part of the project. That was something that they had promised us outside of the project. <clears throat> At this point. It's still not working 100%, um, and I think the, and not that I think, I know that the issue is, is that we have different zones have different older units, older controls, and so that's one of the things that we need to look at. I mean, we can't control it off of an iPad. We can't do things like that. We, we're still seeing things that look like they're running, they're not running, they, they look like they're not running, they are running. So that's something that we need to look at. That could be in an EPC, again, that could be another area. But I don't think, you know, at this point, I'll say it, train's not living up to what they were supposed to live up to. And this is where we need to look elsewhere. This would entail new control. It would entail new software overlay across all of the and additional and new controls on all of the units. So it's not one still on one unit. This is their control and this is our software. It's both talking with each other. So this might be our question for the architect. Or, um, New York State's passed the Climate Act. They're requiring everyone to transition 100% to electricity. There's nothing in this project even really thinking about that or alternatives to fuel or should we be talking about that? Maybe not as part of this project, but at what point does the school district start talking about transitioning to uh, electricity, producing our own electricity, storing our own, those sorts of things? Are you seeing that in other, other districts? Not, not so much. Uh, no, because. There's some point it's going to be. Still is at a point where it doesn't make a lot of sense yet. So I think what's going to happen, it's going to wind up changing somewhere. Uh, so that's. But, we have our engineers, you know, so I can get back to you if you, if you want, uh, on what you know, what is taking place and what they know about that. Uh, but that's something we always keep our eyes on. But it's just like the, the whole bus, the bus, bus thing. Too. I was just going to say yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, if you look at rural districts, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to have the power grid to charge your buses. So there has to be some sort of common sense that we have to use, and then you know, codes will follow too. What happens, but our engineers will stay. Looks like we got a lot of flat roofs up there. Kelly and I came from, there are two districts in New York State that have the co generation plants. I worked for one and she worked for the other. And guess what? They each of them don't have them anymore. All right. So they would, you know, but <clears throat> and good conversation, but it becomes really tough for especially rural or a small school district. Invest that kind of money for a return on investment. But I haven't heard much about it. I mean, we're hearing this much about buses at this point. I don't see. I don't see it going in the direction or the timeline that they're projecting, just because there's so much that has to have to, to be done, not only to the technology but to the infrastructure. There's no way the state can afford it. Or questions? I have a question about the greenhouse. Is that if we wanted to entertain that, we have to go back to the drawing board? Um, do, do we have any support of that as a board? Do we want to go back and talk about the greenhouse? I, if it's something, it's a good idea. Well, if it's something we're going to entertain, I guess I would, I would want to know 
who actually uses it, how much would it be used? You know what I mean? Do, does this the science class go use it, or is there actually a, a course in a, a, or is it just a club? I don't know. I don't know anything. Who who would be using it, and to what extent, I guess, to put money into it? I guess I, that's what I want to know. Rather than put, you know, like a smaller one out on a property somewhere that's just a freestanding, you know, I don't know. Maybe that, I don't know. Right. I guess so it needs to know more about it. Up because it looks like there's Sorry? parking. It's a what are we getting up because it looked like there would be parking. Well, <laughs> so I said that our, there might be uh, fuel tanks in the ground where it would yeah. be located too, which would be, I'm assuming, a huge expense. Um, but yeah, I guess to I would want to know, that's all I want to know is like how many people, how often, how frequently would it be used? So one of the pieces that I would encourage us to do too that I didn't capture in that steps is to take a walking tour of the whole district mm -hmm. yeah. so that all of our board members can actually see and our community members for, mm -hmm. for that. For, perhaps we host a number of walking tours mm -hmm. in the district to actually get eyes on each of the spaces that we're talking about. Um, currently when you enter the agriculture side of the technology wing, there's a small room that has windows on one side that's full of plants from floor to ceiling right now, that they're actively using that in a few classes um, to to start you know growing in the growing season and then our students go outside and transplant those and harvest them and we serve some of them in our cafeteria currently. Um, so it's that kind of use. Could there be greater potential for other classes? With all of these spaces, that, that's kind of the vision. But the other huge piece is um, <coughs> early assumptions from Terry. Who was that? Was that uh, Ben Wood mentioned the the fact that um, state ed is very hesitant to approve that as an instructional space in order to recapture aid. Um, when you're talking about you know something at four hundred four hundred fifty thousand dollars. If that's not eatable, it's a non-starter, in, in my opinion. Um, do you have a sense of that? Yeah, had, we had a conversation. Okay. It's funny, you were saying maybe it's be, but being a learning station is different. Yeah, I think that's what we're dealing with yeah. right now in a different district. It has a greenhouse that's a, a found building, so it's not documented on any of their, any of their records. Um, and we're getting some pushback from SED because it was not attached. So if it's attached, then it becomes eligible for you to use it mm -hmm. as a lab because you're not taking students out of the building to take them to a, a learning space. So I think if, if we're looking at this from a ability standpoint, you know, I think the argument would be to approach SED with this as a it's, it's an addition, so that it's, it's going to have to go for a preliminary plan submission anyway. Um, do we talk about it as a as a lab as an actual agricultural component? Or a science component, you know, or a STEM component, anything you can really think of is it becomes a multi use area and approach SED with that aspect rather than having it be a, a detached item. Right. I think it bears mentioning <clears throat> um, right in the greenhouse question made me think of it that. Everything that we're looking at tonight, there's some of lots of the items on here are we really need to do this. That has to happen. And then some of them are, well, we should do it. Or if it doesn't happen this time, it's gonna need to happen next time. And then some of them are, well, it'd be really cool if we had this. It, it's not a need, it's very much a want. So I think that's where you know the survey comes in and the input from stakeholders and we whittle it down and arrive at a final scope and that will be forthcoming. Am I? Spot on. Yep. Can I ask something really quick? Please. We see this all the time in districts. Whatever you're planning a major renovation to those space such as the technology lab. The hardest thing to do is to get people to think about how they would use the space. They're very good with talking about how they do use the space. But think of it in the context of the possibly opportunities that you're going to have. You know by opening up that glass in the front, you're exposing kids to programs that they didn't even know existed behind those walls. So it may not be a certified CTP program, but you're going to get someone who's going to look at machining, or look at you know CNC work 
If they don't walk past that class, they would have never been interested. And that could be something that could be her alternative path to that. So as you're going through this planning process, especially with that, um, don't limit yourself to what you do now in those spaces. Think about what you want to do in those spaces. Goes back to the technology forum. If we could have that somehow, maybe with other districts that you guys have seen could have similar approaches. Maybe they want to help mm -hmm. us think through what's there. I know you've been to. You mentioned Oxford was one. Yeah, was yeah. And they similar. they've offered for us to go <coughs> visit, take a field trip. Maybe that's something that we would like. See that I think space. Windsor's pretty advanced. Windsor, yeah. 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 I mean, that might help with what you're all suggesting that we to kind of get inspired, right? And thank you for, for mentioning that. I, I did want to make a point of, of, of thanking the work that was done on that, uh, those renderings and the initial design work for that space. That awesome. Um, and it, I think, <laughs> personally, that falls under that we need this. I think Column I have it black. Don't I have it black? I don't know color wise, but I think <laughs> I'm way, way behind, and that's just playing catch up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that is important to say. So, our next step would be the community survey. Yeah, I will finish that up um, this week and get that to all of you for feedback and consideration before that goes um, public. I'm hearing a separate survey specific for students. Um, one of the first questions on the survey is to kind of define your role within the community. Um, I currently have it set up so it's still anonymous. So I'm not collecting phone numbers or names or emails from people, but just asking you know, are you a parent, faculty, staff, community member, other community member, taxpayer? Um, because we know we have many people in our community who come and enjoy our facilities um, who no longer have kids in our district or never have kids in our district. Um, but yet they're all contributing taxpayers to our district and support our schools. So, you know, this is not uh, my project. This is not Carrie's project. Um, this belongs to our community. And so community input uh, for, from as many different voices is going to be critical to drive where we end up. Um, so that is, uh, that's our next step. I, I was thinking when you were talking about um, tours and having maybe several, uh, rather than maybe several, I was thinking having a virtual tour, kind of like when you were buying real estate sometimes, um, well, because there are many people in our community who physically aren't able or don't want to uh, go to athletic uh, con uh, contests but they want to see them and so they have availed themselves to our technology that way love that idea yeah. and so I'm thinking if we had a virtual yeah um, like you basically showed at one point where you were going through uh, I think that would be much better than having six tours where you have a small group of people. Well, you know, I almost wonder if it doesn't make sense to do the tours or to have them before we do the survey. If they would be better informed to respond. So, uh, that has me thinking too about order. Perhaps we do a public forum where we offer this similar presentation again, an opportunity for anybody to come, and then survey, and then forum again. There's a lot of different ways to, to go about that. Um, this meeting was follow your lead at this, this point. Was open. Excuse me. This was open, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was <laughs> yeah, oh, yes. I expected more people. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So I'm not sure uh, about the forum. But I think the virtual tour first, maybe, and then the survey. Yeah, then they have a better idea of what they're answering to. Right. Or answering for. If it were 
are offered online and archived and viewable by the you know, general public at their leisure too. So um, that offers another opportunity to exposure and pitch. Right? Mm -hmm. That is because who doesn't love to get on those real estate things and mm -hmm. go through <laughs> and look at, the, look at everything? Another thing, rather than just putting it on our web page, which is very important, but uh, Delhi Telephone, I've heard people say, oh, I, I, I saw Channel this. Channel 1? Yeah, and yeah, have that on the TV. The only thing, now this is my, um, I don't think it quite fits <laughs> the term paranoia, but um, I'm always very thoughtful about the degree to which we reveal the inside layout of our facilities in a very public way from a security perspective. Yeah. I think there's a way to achieve both, whether that be a slideshow of pictures of current areas or stuff like that, rather than a traveling you know, roadmap. It isn't a new new thing to think about. It is well, yes. Yeah, we're always thinking about it. <laughs> so, any other questions, concerns, thoughts, directives, etc.? Okay. I appreciate all the work that we're doing. Thank you, and Terry, for your yeah, work. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, there's, yeah, no one else here. We do not do executive session. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, our next board meeting is Monday, October 24th. The high School Media Library Center at 5 p.m. We will convene an executive session at 5 p.m. and return to open session at 6 p.m. The deadline for the items to be placed on the board agenda is Tuesday prior to each board meeting. Do you have any questions? What's today? What's today? I was going to say, I think that's the fifth sale. Uh, so, okay. Motion to adjourn. Sean. And a second. Second. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.
Oh, I will just oh, yeah. ask. And I think that there's also opportunity for no. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll let you know what's up. Nice and Nice and Yes. Yeah. Are you going to do virtually? Do you guys have stuff in my office still? Uh, I don't know. Somebody, or maybe it's Carrie's. Oh, you are? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. 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 All it's funny you played in the soccer on Saturday. You can spring it with that one. I realized that we're stuck on the same thing. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, we got it. So they have an antiquated kind of. Yeah, because right now, we don't like the same thing. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's right. It's right. Yeah, I said that's great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 